looking forward to your insights. Um, we might start with an overall perspective in terms of regulation and compliance. Um, obviously, in the fallout of the financial crisis, we had a raft of new legislation, but I think one of the important elements of the financial crisis is it, it led the compliance role to be elevated within organisations um, to a, a whole new level from what it had been previously. So you might talk us through, you know, what that has been like an experience for you within your organisation. Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. First of all, I just want to say I'm delighted to, to be with you guys today. It's a, it's a real honour. Um, I, I suppose like there's been a real journey and a real, a real evolution, like working in very highly regulated industries over the years, like legal and like financial, for example. I've seen that evolution in, in real life kind of unfold in front of me. So first of all, I suppose the main thing to call out is the role of the compliance department hasn't really changed. Like the role is still the same. It's it's there to protect our people. It's there to protect our customers. It's there to protect our business, the environment, uh, and whatnot. Then what you look at is what has actually happened. What has really shot compliance to that board level um, issue? Really, is the fact that maybe through the financial crisis, um, we saw that our regulators were basically accused of being asleep at the wheel um, ultimately there was no teeth to the regulation so like you saw things like in financial services where there was reckless lending there was uh, all sorts of uh, callous kind of deals happening but there there the, the, there was no real uh, thought for the consequences so then comes along as the financial crash we see like um, ultimately um compliance in general being seen as a tick box exercise so there was department no, under the stairs uh, absolutely it's just like look we're seen to be doing this but but is that are we actually carrying this out are we actually living these values and and the fact was businesses and financial services banks they, they they really weren't so if you look at the last decade alone even in just the basic level of compliance this is know your customer that anti-money laundering kind of legislation about $26 billion in fines, that is basic regulation. So what you see then is uh, that whole kind of, you know, evolution then into, do we have like uh, enough regulation? Are we doing enough then into potentially what we see as over-regulation? You look at something like financial services now, you have multiple regulators to contend with. You have the uh, Central Bank of Ireland, you have the Financial Services and Pensions Ombudsman, and you now have the DPC, who is my favorite of them all, by the way. Um, so like you you look at like compliance coming down the the, the line, it's now suddenly, it, it's no longer just in financial services. GDPR really kind of catapulted compliance yeah, into like the board of, yeah. of every business, small business, big business, financial services, everything yeah. is cross industry now. And if we look back on that, Kevin, it is really a really bold piece of legislation at the time. And, you know, obviously um, it was probably the most far next to the California Privacy Act. It was the next kind of, you know, chunky piece of data protection um, regulation. And to what extent, you know, obviously um, other countries dealing uh, with citizens in the EU had to comply with GDPR. But we're now four years in. To what extent is that embedded? And to what extent has GDPR become the gold standard, if you like, of our in our industry? Well, well, GDPR really is the gold standard and, and you just have to take a step back. Initially, when you think about it, it's only 99 articles. The, it, the, the concepts in there weren't new to us. Like we had these concepts before. Um, ultimately, what happened with the GDPR became technology neutral because that's one of the issues that we had. Technology outpaced regulation. It continues to outpace regulation. So what the GDPR did was, for example, it stripped out that technology focus. So if we just even jump back just uh, to, to look at history, if we look at our previous Data Protection Act, it was only up to date for one day because the next day the modern internet was born. So that's the first thing. It's like it strips out that technology and gives us those basic elements of the lawfulness of like the processing. What are you collecting? What are you doing with it? How transparent are you? So these are all very basic, basic concepts. It does not sound that difficult, but when you try to put that into practice, when you actually take that step back and go every single thing that I need to do, I need to be thinking about data protection by default and design. So I'm building it from the foundations up. But one of the things with GDPR, for example, it's very difficult to build that into older systems. So if we come back to financial services, legacy systems, massive issue, but neither here nor there. How then are we looking at like it really being the gold standard? We have the GDPR, we have that extraterritorial reach, for example. So although it, it does, um, it, 
affect all the, the EU countries. But basically, if you're a company in China or anywhere in the world and you deal with EU citizens, you must comply with the GDPR. It's as simple as that. So that extra territorial reach has made it like a, a, a real powerhouse in legislation. Not only that, you look at like multinationals like ourselves, like Meta, what are we going to do? For example, we have a piece of legislation like the GDPR and it is like it, it's chunky when you try to uh, pull it together with like all the requirements with technology and the platforms that we have. But that is the gold standard. If we're building in things like access to your data, erasure, where we're operationalizing all these things that are built into the GDPR. Well, when we're doing it for GDPR, it's easier for us then to offer that out to our global um, customers, for example, because now like we've built it, it works. It, it, the, the, that, that is, um, the, the, you're, you're going to go from the, the highest level that you have to um, uh, hit, and then you, you can actually plateau, like that is now the level that we give to all our customers. Then you actually look at it from legislation around the world. So like most of the privacy pieces of legislation that, that are popping up around the world now, like we're beginning to operationalize privacy legislation in, in like Japan, in Thailand, in the Philippines. We're looking at uh, even just the, the US itself. There is no unified uh, piece of legislation. You referred there to the California and the CCPA. Well, now there's five or six different uh, states. So like we, we had, um, I think it was Connecticut the other day has a version of uh, privacy legislation. We have Utah, we have all these states now. So the state level um, mm -hmm. regulation that mirrors the GDPR, they're actually lesser, um, in my opinion, lesser versions of the GDPR. So the GDPR remains the gold standard. So these other countries are actually looking at the GDPR. They're looking at the extraterritoriality, the, the, the reach, they're, they're looking at objections. They're looking at all these different things. It's all from the GDPR and they're actually making it their own. You have things like it's, it's got the reach of like Brazil, LGPD. It, it is essentially a copy and paste of the GDPR. So for that reason, I would say that the GDPR is that gold standard. It goes right back to, in my opinion, the, the USA is the world leader in technology, but the European Union is the world leader in setting standards. Yeah, so when it comes, looking forward then, Kevin, and we're talking about new regulation, I think that all new regulation is going to be driven, obviously, by fintech. I think we've kind of at a mature um, level in terms of regulation for financial services, the traditional financial services. And that kind of brings me on to the topic of blockchain. Now, obviously, when we think about blockchain, we talk about, you know, fintech. And blockchain is obviously a huge enabler there. But one of the key aspects of blockchain seems to be at odds with GDPR, and that's the one with, you know, were the right to be forgotten. Um, how is industry dealing with that and how is industry kind of coping with that, almost those two combative? Well, so, um, so it's very interesting, first of all, you say fintech. Um, fintech is, is one of those things that there, there's no specific um, regulation for fintech and um, it's more down towards things like the traditional financial services. So if you're um, in consumer credit, provision of banking or insurance services or something like that, you're going to come into um, that regular kind of um, regulation that you know, you're going to have to apply for a, a, a license with the central bank, you're going to have to be regulated by the central bank. But a lot of companies are trying to sidestep that. They're like, I'm more tech than I am fin, for example. So and that, that it's an unlevel playing field. It's really, you know, yeah. A hundred percent. And then that's what brings you straight into things like, you know, the blockchain. So like it is something like a cryptocurrency. Is that actually a currency? Is it just a, a, a way to actually record transactions? And this is where these arguments in the whole fintech space comes in. And so then like we're talking about the, 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 the blockchain in in general and like how it clashes with GDPR in some ways and then in other ways it is actually just that perfect marriage so you do uh, you you just raised there about the right to erasure the right to erasure is one of those things that I find quite challenging um, in our own business like there there is a, a drive to allow people to mint their own NFTs non-fungible tokens these are like little we'll images we'll come to those they're yeah, talking yeah. all on their own uh, and and we'll, we'll come to that in a little while, but but that that all kind of comes down to that right to erasure. So like, um, if we can't erase something from the blockchain, 
then are we going to be in, in breach of GDPR? Now, there are actual ways that we actually can erase things from the blockchain. And there are different like kind of, uh, so you would have to have like a digital wallet that is uh, anonymized completely and you can actually go and burn things. So burn full chunks of the chain, but that costs a lot of money. That uh, kind of will bring you into like, uh, it might cost you something like a couple of dollars to mint, uh, something like an NFT, but it might cost you a couple of thousand dollars to burn that in gas fees. So these are kind of things that are, that are challenging at the minute. Um, I Just suppose... Yeah, yeah, just picking up on that um, terminology, gas fees, I find it fascinating that, you know, that there's a whole new language built around the blockchain in terms of, you know, traditionally we would have transaction fees, but there seems to be one move away from even the language of traditional financial services and they call it, you know, costs within the blockchain, you burn gas. It's, you know, the, the terminology is just for anybody who's not familiar with blockchain, it's just the terminology can sometimes, you know, throw you. So the cost of getting rid of data is really moving it onto a completely anonymized um, kind of set aside wallet. And then basically the cost of doing that is gas. That that's also yeah a, exactly and so like the, there are going to have to be like creative solutions here but also um like there's nothing that we can't create a solution for basically um and and the way that we would do that and the whole gas thing is it's like ultimately there is a cost every time that a token moves hands or changes hands or or you're creating another block on that actual chain and uh, that's exactly what we're going to be doing when we're looking at things like um erasure there's going to be a, a, a digital wallet that's that's literally not going to be published. And that is where things are being moved to in that chain. So then it just essentially it's erasure without erasure. So it's technically not compliant with the GDPR. We're going to have to do some sort of just jiggly. moved it onto the bed. It, it, exactly. It, 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 it's, 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 it's a form of anonymization, I guess. So th these are the kind of challenges, though, when you look at something like GDPR. And again, it, it, it's one of those things. Erasure. You say that to somebody and they're like, what's so difficult about that? Press delete, it's gone. And you're like, well, actually, no, with modern technology, that's not how it works. And, and there are these challenges. And that's what brings it right back to GDPR. It's a massive beast. But is it, is it a beast? No, the, the actual concepts are very simple. It's how do you apply those concepts in practice? Yeah, just for those of you who are listening but aren't overly familiar with blockchain, really all it is is there's a lot of kind of cloak and dagger around the whole concept of blockchain, but really all it is is a decentralized ledger of transactions across a peer-to-peer -peer network. So you're taking out that middleman and you're just taking out the kind of the, the bank, if you like, in a, in a kind of cryptocurrency sense. And we've got thousands of nodes, i.e. computers, and it's those nodes that are kind of, they represent hundreds of thousands of accountants and auditors that are verifying information and attaching it onto this blockchain. But it's, you know, it's 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 very, um, it's all very cloak and dagger, Kevin. It, it, it kind of is in a way. Um, I feel it's like a, a way for people to, to try and maybe um, understand it a little bit is push it back into like what is traditional financial services. There's a level of trust there. Like I'm going to send money to you from my traditional bank. I trust AIB will send that money to HSBC or whatever those banks are. And there's that level of trust between those intermediaries or, or those banks. What the, the blockchain does, it actually gives you that level of transparency and traceability. And also, so there's basically a way of building up that trust. I want to buy this from you. I'm going to receive it. I can see that transaction happening in real time. So essentially you have that trust in the transaction without um, ever meeting. So when we say things like, you know, well, we can already do um, internet banking and the likes of that, that is 100% true. But this is a way to actually sidestep the traditional um, institutions, but at the same time, you know, building a, a kind of a trust network that's, you, you, it's immutable. You can't delete stuff in the traditional sense from that. You can see the full transactions. It's reducing costs. So like you're not waiting for an intermediary to wake up or do something in, in another country or another time zone. These kind of things can happen uh, theoretically in real time. So it can speed it up. It can reduce costs. There, there's a lot of kind of things that take it out of uh, traditional financial services. But with all those benefits, there are also a lot of potential negatives as well. Um, it, it, it's like any technology. 
you know, it's not the technology that's good or bad. It's how people decide to use it. it. Yeah. So, I mean, we talked about, first of all, you know, the positive attributes. So obviously you talked about increased transparency, even outside of the field of financial services. You know, blockchain is, is, is an incredibly powerful tool. You know, you've got, as you mentioned, increased and transparency, you've got accurate tracking, you've got cost reductions. And, you know, we spoke earlier about, especially for developing countries, blockchain is hugely important in, you know, recording stuff like land registry um you know talk through that like if uh, i would encourage people to look at estonia like a a, a country that is basically 100 percent digital and they have managed to um use like a a centralized version of blockchain to run most of their services in the country in what would appear to be a gdpr compliant way now we would have to kind of caveat that with uh it hasn't been fully challenged from a GDPR data protection perspective just yet. But essentially what they're doing is like you, you can complete a property transaction same day in Estonia. You think about all those uh, requisitions and title and all that uh, are per uh, solicitors and I'll have to go through uh, here, checking up boundaries, checking all that paperwork, all that, um, you know, consistency and title and, and stuff like there's a lot of work that goes into it because it's paper based in the likes of Ireland. Then you go to Estonia and I'm like, OK, um, Joanne, I'm going to sell my house to you. There you go. Transaction completed on the blockchain. Like I can clearly see that that title has moved. So when you actually just think about the the reduction in cost, the efficiency in, in that kind of a property system, but in a they they actually offer most of their services and their government services through like a, a digital ID so that that's linked to the blockchain so there is that whole trust element there is that tokenization there is that um there that there's almost like intermediaries in between each of those databases that is doing that verification through that digital ID and the likes of that so the data itself is encrypted and tokenization is kind of passing its way between um, various databases before that they can actually access those services. So it's a real example of how technology can be amazing whenever it's actually yeah, uh, put to the good use. Yeah. Good um, and we talked about the positives, but some of the negatives really are kind of around. We're dealing with some very complex technology that is kind of, as you say, we've still got human error can become a feature. Obviously, we've got the regulatory um, challenges. And then that brings us on to NFTs or non fungible tokens. These, yeah. these are the fun bit, or as I read, recently the n in non-fungible tokens stands for nothing so um you might want to you know first of all you might want to explain kevin you probably explain better too uh, in case anybody's not familiar with nfts what are nfts and why are they you know why is there such a why is there such a hype about nfts well i suppose uh it, it is uh it's a different world uh, i think the n uh, that's actually quite funny to to say nothing because technically you're you're buying nothing but is it any different really to buying a license like to use something so if you think about uh the metaverse now which is going to be amazing everybody join the metaverse <laughs> buy your oculus um uh, shameless plug um anyway uh for an nft for example you can imagine now how uh, brands are, are going to use NFTs. So yeah, you're buying nothing, but you might be buying the ability to have a Nike jumper on your avatar in the, the metaverse. You might be buying a piece of digital art. Some people like having like the the, the rights to uh, like a piece of digital art because maybe that's just the way that they um, uh, they they use or, or see the world or they they use like digital displays in their house or something like that so it's a different way of just consuming things like art it's a different way of basically expressing yourself it's it's another way for brands for example to monetize in this new digital world so like that is one of the the potential use cases of, of an nft now there are potentially thousands millions of other use cases but that that is just kind of kind of one of them and some of the negative ones um, like that was associated with it was it squid games got a lot of negative publicity and um, you know this comes down to just basically um, anything on the blockchain in general because uh, the blockchain nfts uh, digital crypto uh, currencies all of that is, is it's it's super in one way because it's built on a smart contract so if you think of uh, like a super good thing that you could use a smart contract for and and, and this is, would be on the blockchain imagine you're actually uh, doing a, a corporate mergers and acquisitions kind of a deal now 
And as part of that, we would traditionally have to get a, a whole slew of NDAs and stuff like that before you could share the information. But then you're basically relying on uh, the, 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 the NDA and trust and all the rest of it for all that data that you've now shared so that they can decide if they're going to buy you or what. That's very sensitive information about the business. You could actually use a smart contract on the blockchain that will allow you to only see that for two weeks and then that will actually erase the data because the smart contract doesn't see any kind of gray area. It's black or white and that's it. But that also has negatives. So you actually mentioned Squid Games there. So Squid yeah. Games is actually um, uh, a, a, a was an online game and it was modeled around um, the Squid Games show on Netflix. But ultimately what happened, we had some bad actors there. They developed this game. It was uh, you, you bought um, tokens to, to join the game. But the whole idea behind it was you play the game and you will earn tokens and then in turn those tokens can be converted into the ability to cash out this new cryptocurrency everything looked great people were playing the game everything was amazing but within that contract um, it did say that in order to cash out your crypto um, you would need to earn these uh, tokens by going up the various levels or whatever but what happened with these things, like it's a decentralized cryptocurrency, so there's nothing behind it, there's no regulation, but there was a bit of hype online and suddenly it went up by something like two, 3,000%. Mm -hmm. So like there was suddenly like uh, something like 90, 100 million or something dollars worth of, of money there in that cryptocurrency. The developers ran off with the money essentially, shut down the game because they can no longer um, earn those tokens to get the ability to cash out their cryptocurrency because the smart the smart contract doesn't allow it because the, you can't get the token so you can't um, access the crypto so that crypto is now worthless. Mm -hmm. So like there's, there's just things like that that you know smart contracts can be used for extremely good purposes and they can be used by nefarious actors just to to, to scam people like that um the the, the squid game scout yeah, and we mentioned before about how the EU kind of lead out in terms of um, regulation. It was an interesting in the last couple of days, Maria McGuinness has come out and said that, you know, the EU and the US are working together. Her, you know, herself and Joe Biden signed a, a memorandum of understanding in terms of, you know, getting that legislation. They want to be at the forefront of that. So it's yeah. interesting to see that the regulators are kind of finally getting up to speed with this and seeing that. And can you see the reality of a, you know, a, 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 a cryptocurrency that's pegged back to the euro? Well, that's, that's actually a rather serious um, project that is ongoing at the European Central Bank. Now, personally, I don't quite understand the, the idea behind it, but you know, this may be the future. I, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm, I'm a li little bit behind. But even the UK Central Bank, the ECB, the, the, the United States, for example, they're, they're all working on a centralized version of blockchain. And the centralized just essentially means that it's regulated and all the, the various nodes on that blockchain are actually tied back to tangible assets, i.e. the gold in your reserve or, or whatever is based on your currency. So that, that is actually a quite a serious project and it is moving ahead at pace. Um, again, uh, I, I, I don't particularly understand the need for a crypto element, but uh, that, that might it's, be it's, kind of, it's, it's, it's taking away um, one of the more positive attitude or attributes of blockchain, and that was that we didn't need the centralized body. But I mean, if you're tying blockchain back to that centralization, you're kind of taking away some of the positive attributes. I wanted to finish up, Kevin, and I've actually written it down in front of me with a question. Um, was the NFT of Twitter's founders Jack Dorsey's first tweet really worth 2.7 million? And is it wise to invest in NFTs sold by Paris Hilton or worse still, a bunch of scary looking monkeys smoking cigars? So first of all, um, use a quality platform like Meta platforms. Don't be buying anything from Twitter. <laughs> Obviously, that's the joke. <laughs> um, one of the things I will actually just raise, and uh, now that you mentioned the smoking monkeys, that that actually was one of the use cases that showed that you, there's a real nefarious side to NFTs as well. Because when you actually have something like an NFT and you show somebody the the um, address of, of that NFT, like those smoking monkeys, then you're actually exposing your blockchain wallet because your blockchain wallet is on something like Ethereum. So it's, it's on a decentralized, it won't be on like a meta platform or anything like that. But once I know your um, blockchain um, wallet address, I could start minting anything nefarious in there. 
Um, and that's what's happened in that case with the smoking monkeys. He was getting plagued with things being minted into his, his wallet then. And again, it comes back to those gas fees. Who pays to remove that? Then if you actually talk about the GDPR in general, who's actually the data controller there? Who do you go to for a right to erasure? Because like, again, if, if I was talking from a meta perspective, that wouldn't be us. We don't control your wallet. So that's that 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 wouldn't be us. Now, would that be would that uh, argument stand up with the, the regulators? Possibly not like that. The, there could be a bit of a bit of a, a gray area there. So these are the kind of challenges like data protection in and of itself is a super exciting area. And it might not be for everybody, but uh, I find it super exciting every day. I think that'll be my final word. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. We'll pass you back to Siobhan. Thanks, Kevin. Thank you so much, Kevin and Joanne. That was not only really interesting, but actually entertaining. And I think I could listen to you all day. And uh, it's just fascinating, as you uh, pointed out, Joanne, the whole language that has evolved uh, from the digital age that we live in. And I now know what Squid Games actually uh, is, I often wondered. And I have a much better understanding of the blockchain, I have to say, uh, because traditional lawyers, um, I think it's something that we really need to get up to speed with. Um, so I do have a couple of questions for Kevin. I'll have to hold on to them till the end. Uh, I, you know, I really want to ask you when we get to the Q&A, um, whether your your law qualification, you know, really set you up for this privacy role or how it helped in getting uh, where you are today. But I'll have to uh, abide by the rules um, that I set. And on that note, thank you, Joanne, for the uh, reminder that we're recording, given that we're talking to a privacy expert. Uh, I think that was important to uh, point that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So thanks very much to both of you um, for a, a fascinating discussion there. We're going to move on to another topic now. So I'm going to introduce Fiona Gilday, who is Head of Governance of Flutter Entertainment. And we are fortunate enough to have Fiona as a lecturer on our MA in Governance. So Fiona is going to talk to the topic of green finance. If we can get Fiona on screen. She was, uh, I think, oh yes, I think she's uh, possibly centrally uh, muted by Donald. I did joke at the outset that if you got stuck in the lobby, blame Donald. <laughs> um, so we'll see if we can get Fiona unmuted and uh apologies have... she's rejoining now she got switched to the attendees yeah thanks yeah. donald for that thank you thanks donald hi fiona. and thanks for the introduction yeah thanks very much for joining us fiona so we're going to speak about um green finance and i suppose um as you know a, a non-financial expert um the the sustainability agenda seems to be everywhere uh, currently. And I suppose for many of us, when we think about sustainability, we're thinking about things like climate change and turf bans. How does this fit into uh, financial services? Yeah, so um, thanks. First of all, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to be a part time lecturer on the, the master's programme. And um, so, Siobhan, in terms of sustainability, well, that's not new and climate change not new, but it certainly has gained a lot of traction over the last couple of years. And it's even as part of like a government agenda, so political agenda. So the government have in place what's called an Ireland for Finance strategy for 2025. And that effectively is a strategy that is a whole of government commitment in partnership with the private sector. And that's aimed at uh, developing the international financial services sector here in Ireland. So as I said, this is a political and economical as well as societal aspect to the area of green finance and sustainability. And climate change has gained so much importance in the last few years that it's really forced governments and companies to take stock of the climate crisis. So what companies are now doing is they're reevaluating their risk registers to identify, you know, if climate risks represent a material risk for them and to determine you know, what kind of actions do they take to mitigate against those risks. Specifically for financial services, they're currently looking at how they can really steer sustainable development 
by environmental and socially conscious financing and investment decisions. So in terms of that government strategy, they also release what, you know, an annual action plan. And that action plan really sets out key areas of focus for the government um, each year to further grow and develop the financial services sector in Ireland. And a key theme of this year's action plan is on this area of sustainable finance and specifically the role that financial services sector uh, put in sustainability and climate change. And at the centre of that is this area of green finance that's you know, seen as a key priority. OK, so that gives a really interesting insight there into the role of government policy. Um, and again, for the uninitiated in uh, finance, what does green finance actually mean? Yeah, sure. So green finance is essentially structured financial activity that has been created to you know, ensure a better financial or sorry, environmental outcome. And as we move to a decarbonised economy, we're looking at the need for unprecedented levels of new capital investment, particularly in the form of green finance. And that's to support activities that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And that's to help companies to adapt to the impact of climate change. So like many other countries, Ireland signed up to the Paris Agreement to limit global warming and reduce our overall greenhouse gas emissions and to create this clear path to net zero. But in order to achieve those goals, you know, the likes of the G20, they estimate that global investment of about $90 trillion is required in order for us to achieve global sustainable development and climate objectives. So to limit, you know, global warming increases to 1.5 um, degrees. So there's a huge funding requirement and that'll create investment and lending opportunities for the financial services sector. But green finance can also take the form of, you know, preferential green rates for lending of companies that engage in environmentally friendly practices, such as building houses to high environmental standards. But green finance has the potential to be one of the most effective tools deployed to fight climate change because it specifically targets um, on areas that will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, that are specifically, you know, responsible for rising temperatures. So there's a need to uh, ensure that there's an availability of the, in the financial system for um, capital for green and sustainable finance. And that in turn requires the development of these new financing tools uh, to match sort of investors with green financing requirements. So in terms of some examples, they would be the likes of green bonds, green equity funds, green securitization, and then maybe some more sort of um, products like green loans and green mortgages that people will be more familiar with. Green bonds in particular have become an investment vehicle of choice to finance projects with environmental benefits, in particular, the likes of low carbon transport or clean, you know, clean power or energy efficient buildings. They've specifically availed of that type of finance, and it's become a highly recognised asset that attracts, you know, ever increasing amounts of institutional capital, and is likely to be a mainstay of, you know, this whole green finance revolution. In terms of like green equity funds, that's a, a structured investment vehicle that selects investments based on a commitment to a green investment strategy, and that structure enables different a different investors to pool their capital um, in order to pursue you know, an agreed investment strategy. And that's been used extensively to support in renewable energy and is also now you know, a well-accepted investment tool. In terms of green securitization, that's the bundling of green loans into securities that can unlock capital to finance the transition to this you know, decarbonized climate resilient economy. So securitization enables this aggregation of multiple small scale loans to help attract, you know, a different investor base. And importantly, securitization um, of existing loans gives banks and other primary lenders an opportunity to refinance their existing loan portfolios. And therefore, they can recycle uh, capital to create fresh portfolios of green loans. And then on 
green loans, um, that's you know, effectively loans that are aimed at advancing environmental sustainability. They're very similar to green bonds. And then the green mortgages, many of the means, like mainstream lenders now offer green mortgages, and that effectively offers lower interest rates or, or cash back on properties that are more energy efficient. So we're likely to see all of these products being increasingly utilized um, in the coming years. And we do expect that over time, they'll become a little bit more sophisticated variations of them um, that will ultimately emerge on the market. But yeah, that, that's effectively what green finance is. That's fascinating, Fiona. And, you know, now that you explain it, it makes perfect sense. I've heard of green mortgages, um, but it's really interesting how all those linkages appear between, you know, the, the green agenda and uh, all the different aspects of finance. And you say that obviously, um, you know, say green um, uh, mortgages, for example, are being incentivized uh, and the green agenda is being promoted and there's definitely going to be a growth in that area. So are, is there a growth in opportunities in this area, by which I mean, I suppose, you know, job roles and employability opportunities, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. So Ireland's built itself up this really good reputation already for being a centre for green finance. And, you know, green finance or sustainable finance does represent a huge growth area. So at the moment, only 1% of bonds, of the bond market is green bonds. So that's a huge opportunity. And Ireland's well known in terms of, of bonds. And in fact, on the, the course that we're discussing and promoting, last year we had a guest speaker from the, uh, from the stock exchange and she gave an insight into the volume of green finance, particularly green bonds that were be, being traded exclusively in Ireland. So we're seeing a huge growth in this area. But Ireland has a sustainable finance roadmap, and that sets out a programme of work and research um, that's going to include the establishment of an international sustainable finance centre of excellence here. And that'll support leading on research and development activities for innovative financial mechanisms to facilitate this transition to a sustainable economy. So sustainable finance is also at the top of the regulators' priorities now. So the likes of the central bank. And even last week, the European Central Bank issued a press release where they strongly recommended the European Commission's proposals to incorporate environmental risks into EU banking regulation. And it's a matter of, of when, not if, that is implemented. HIT will introduce new legal requirements for banks to prepare detailed plans on how they will address climate-related and environmental risks that are not currently aligned to EU policy on targets. So the, what we've seen in the last few years is that the global financial sector has evolved. And the question for Ireland is really about like how we position ourselves to maximise our contribution and our expertise in sustainable finance, which is a mega trend in the capital markets at the moment. So, you know, for anyone that's thinking about a career in sustainable finance or even interested in this subject, this master's programme is going to give you a really good insight into this evolving area. And it's unlikely that there'll be any shortage of demand for green finance in the coming years because financial institutions do have to play their part in supporting delivery of Ireland's climate action plan and with it's going to bring loads of opportunities for graduates and you're going to have you know an abundance of organizations that are going to be seeking experts in this area so this program is a great way to develop your knowledge and expertise no, thanks for that, Fiona. And um, so there's some interesting linkage there with the, the regulatory environment, um, which mm -hmm. Kevin had um, talked about. Um, just to focus um, on governance, how does the sustainability agenda impact on governance, do you think? Yeah, we have seen a huge sh shift in terms of governance structures across large companies, you know, within the financial sector and also within other sectors. And that's primarily driven by increased in interest um, from investors. But some cases, it can be pressure from investors or pressure from regulators. And they're really 
holding the likes of you know the board of directors to account to ensure that there are robust governance structures in place that there's appropriate oversight and accountability for climate risks and opportunities um, and this has been particularly evident with a, an increase and in rise in shareholder activism particularly around shareholder meetings um, that have been held in the last couple of weeks so for instance what we are seeing is that many companies are now putting in place board level accountability for climate and sustainability and certainly the company that I work in we have a board risk and sustainability committee and that's responsible for overseeing risk and sustainability and the impact that they could have on the group's reputation um, and one of the key roles of the risk and sustainability committee is to review and oversee sustainability reporting and disclosures and how companies comply with this vast and emerging regulatory requirements on climate and sustainability reporting. Um, some companies have been reporting on sustainability information on a voluntary basis for a couple of years, but for, for the most part, it's now mandatory disclosures um, at the EU level. So companies really need to be um, ahead of the game with this. With that, with mandatory um, disclosures and reporting requirements, that has um, been seen as quite important for a number of reasons, including the growing awareness from investors on sustainability risks, but also for the growing market for investment products that are looking to achieve you know, sustainable objectives, but also the need for public policy um, perspective to assess the environmental and social impacts of companies and the sectors you know, within which help inform strategies for the future. And those new reporting requirements, that includes everything from EU directives on sustainability to frameworks such as SASB and TCFD. And that evolving regulatory framework on sustainability has really forced companies to review their own governance practices, to look at how their targets and metrics are measured, evaluated and monitored and to make sure that those plans they put in place are proactive to mitigate against climate risk and that those organizations are playing a positive impact on society. Sounds like a really rapidly evolving um, environment, uh, Fiona. And I might just finish by asking you uh, to tell us a little bit about what must be a very busy role as uh, head of governance at Flutter Entertainment, if you don't mind. Yeah, so I'm the Deputy Company Secretary and Head of Governance of Flutter Entertainment, and that's a very large listed company. It's, um, it's a FTSE 100, it's actually a FTSE 25, and it has a dual listing on the London and Dublin stock exchanges. My role is so diverse, um, but it does primarily involve me leading on governance work streams for strategic projects, particularly mergers and acquisitions. And I was really interested in what Kevin said about NDAs because, um, yeah, smart contracts would be really useful for me. Um, but I also work on a lot of internal projects that impact on the overall group strategy. So that could be anything like um, we had a huge central securities migration last year, which effectively meant we had to move our security settlement platform from the UK model to a European model whenever the UK left um, the EU. But Flutter is a, a very large group and we need to have in place financing arrangements to undertake capital investments. So my role would also involve supporting with financing or refinancing arrangements. So everything from term loans to revolving credit facilities. And I'd work very closely with the Treasury's team to make sure that we do have funds available for M&A activity or reinvestment. But I also work on any projects that either directly or indirectly could impact on our stock exchange listing. So that can also include ongoing compliance with listing rules and governance codes and a whole plethora of regulation. There seems to be regulation coming from everywhere, but also our adherence to licensing requirements. And then as part of my role, I would work very closely with the board of directors to make sure that we do have appropriate governance mechanisms in place for the parent company. And that'll include everything from, you know, underneath our sustainability and risk committee, we have a sustainability working group that I sit on and um, I project manage the likes of, you know, annual report and disclosures to the market on various regulatory requirements. 
And then Flutter is a listed company. So there's always an external evaluation of our governance practices. So my role would involve supporting the board with investor governance roadshows, liaison with institutional investors. And then even last week we had our um, AGM. So any sort of large shareholder events, I'd also support them. What I would say is that the role is so varied, uh, but it's also so interesting. And certainly there's a huge demand for governance and compliance professionals at the moment. So anyone with a qualification in this area, you're very much in demand, particularly in the financial services sector. So I'd encourage anyone who's interested in this area, you know, this master's program is a great way to really propel your career. And if you do have a qualification in governance and compliance, the jobs tend to find you as opposed to you finding the job. So, you know, it, it's great for a career move for anyone that's interested in it. Thanks a million, Fiona. And uh, it's just so interesting to speak to you. And again, uh, I just wish we had more time. Um, thank you very much for that. We might come back to you in the Q&A, but your, uh, the last point you may have made there just segues nicely into the, uh, the, the, the final speaker of the evening. So thanks very much, Fiona. Uh, and I'm in very esteemed company uh, this evening. So our final speaker is Naomi Hegarty who is um, IT Risk and Global Technology uh, Privacy Officer at PGIM Ireland. And Naomi is a very recent graduate of the MA in Governance, Compliance and Data Protection um, in Financial Services at ATU Donegal. You're very welcome, Naomi. Thank you, Siobhan. Uh, Naomi, would you um, maybe um, start by telling us just a little bit about your job role and then we might look at how the program um, you know supported you in what I know is a really busy uh, job role. Yeah sure um, Siobhan I have a background in, in, in IT and in operational risk so operational risk itself um, you know has uh, that wide and varied um, risk approach dependent on the business etc one of those risks is obviously privacy risk uh, records management, um, you know, all of that, etc. So the role that I'm currently um, fulfilling is a global technology privacy um, officer role. And with that, like every other company, we are faced with uh, a huge um, technology transformation. Uh, we're faced with regulatory ch change. Um, uh, and in, in particular, um, from a privacy perspective, um, Kevin and Joanne mentioned their Utah and Connecticut and CCPA and CCRA, the new ev evolution of the California rights. Um, so we're we're involved in all of that, as well as looking at uh, you know the privacy regulations in um, you know uh, be it Japan, you know China, India, etc. You know, um, so in terms of the actual program itself, um, obviously the program covers um, ethics and there's a huge element um, to data uh, and um, ethics. Um, it covers data protection. Right. And we actually we actually had to create uh, we had a couple of assignments on um, a data protection program and creating a notice and all of that. Um, so that was actually um, very, a very good exercise to actually do. Um, it also looked at obviously financial services and the regulations, compliance, um, security and audit, um, as well as th there was a, a work based learning. Um, project as well. So all of that ties into the role that I'm actually doing today. And, and it's funny because, you know, the risk management section of it, um, you know, talked about, uh, you know, records management. It talked about um, how how you can, uh, you know, it talked about privacy risks. It talked about, um, you know, IT security and you can't have uh, you can't have um, information security, uh, you know, you can't have privacy, sorry, without information security. So you need that, you know, very strong foundation of security before you can have privacy. Um, so all of the uh, elements of the program um, actually help me with my role today. And I would say that, um, you know, one, one of the things that, that, I, that, I've, that I've learned, right, through the program is that, you know, everything is a requirement, right? A new regulation is a requirement. If you get um, 
a, a, a Dear CEO letter from the Central Bank of Ireland. It's a new requirement. So it's about keeping up with those requirements. Um, it's about, you know, understanding what they mean to your business, taking a risk based approach, um, applying your, uh, you know, the complexity of your business um, to those requirements. It's about goals. It's about the culture, measure of success and very much to what uh, Fiona was saying there. How do you demonstrate that measure of success and how do you ensure the board are, are uh, you know, informed and that there's accountability at the right level? So really, um, one of the main things that I've learned is actually joining the dots across um, all of those requirements and each element of the programme, you know, significantly helped me with that. Uh, I think that sums it up really well, actually, joining the dots, because it is a programme that is kind of, a, a, I suppose, a hybrid of many different areas in the regulatory environment. Um, and joining the dots really sums it up. And um, just before we move to um, some Q&A, Naomi, I know you're in a really busy job role. I used to think I had a busy job until I spoke to uh, our speakers tonight. Um, how did you manage with the uh, demands of taking on a course as well as your job? And did do you feel that the course, you know, your learning on the course kind of supported you in your uh, in your role? Um, I, you already I, spoke I, to that. But yeah, it, it absolutely did support me in, in my role. Um, I would say one thing is it, it's not based, um, any of the assignments um, are not based on my opinion or my, you know, my knowledge. It's all based on research. And for that reason alone, you're actually keeping up to date with the latest and greatest, right? So that's in terms of lifelong learning, I thought that was very um, impactful. Um, and you could embed, there was a flexibility within the course and you could actually embed cloud technology if you needed to. Like I done my work-based learning on um, ransomware and ransomware is a service. Um, and you know how to mitigate against that and incident response plans and things like that. Um, so um, it, I found that you could embed what you wanted to learn yourself within the course for some of the modules. You know, so I found that very very helpful. In terms of the flexibility of the course, the fact that the course was online and the majority of the the sessions were in the evening and it was recorded was really uh, beneficial to me because I couldn't do it otherwise. Um, and only for COVID, it's one of the good things that came out of COVID for me as, as a master's, but um, only for COVID, um, you know, I, I don't think I would have been able to do it because we were at home anyway. Um, there was no traffic. You could just switch from one computer to your personal computer. It was all online recorded, um, et cetera. So I found that very um, helpful indeed. Um, and you could, uh, when you had the time, you could catch up. Um, so I found that very good. Brilliant, Naomi. Thanks very much for that. And I think that um, hits the nail on the head in terms of the, you know, the learnings from COVID and the online environment that we managed to embrace, which is what we're doing now. Uh, some years ago, we probably would have had this um, event on campus um, and the same with the uh, online learning, I think, um, and the digital learning. Uh, it, there's, there's way more flexibility, isn't there? So it's great to hear that. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to try and squeeze in a few questions um, and uh, we may go a little bit over time, uh, but please hang on if you can, um, uh, particularly if you asked a question. I can see there are some questions in the chat, so we might ask um, our speakers to put their cameras back on and see if we can um, go through. Um, I think uh, the, the first question up is uh, for Kevin and it's about blockchain uh, and, and the anonymization that was mentioned. Um, will the criteria for anonymization, um, is there any chance this will be reversed or will it be forever dissolved? Um, and that, that's a really good question. Um, like under GDPR, for example, anonymization needs to be anonymization. And that's actually one of the challenges within GDPR in and of itself is can you truly anonymize something? And it's not truly anonymized if there is any way that it can actually be reversed. But I suppose what we're looking at here in the likes of uh, the, 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 the blockchain and if it's specifically in related to NFTs, we have to kind of take a step back and go, okay, 
what date is actually going to be attached to this NFT. So by the time that, that that actually changes hands, is there any more personal data in there? What is the actual risk of that personal data? We need to take that risk-based approach. Now that's actually something that, that might get challenged by the DPC because it is, um, and the DPC, sorry, the Data Protection Commission, because there is like that argument or that weighted argument at the minute is, is data protection on that risk-based approach? I would argue it is, it has to be because there's risk to everything that we do. So we have to make those um, decisions and, and weigh up all those decisions. To answer the question more specifically, the technology is too new. Do we know can it be reversed? I, I don't, like I can't categorically say that the approach that we might be looking at could not be reversed at this point, but then take a risk-based approach. If you're going to mint uh, an image of a Pokemon, what's the risk if that can get uh, reversed? So like we, we have to like be practical on, on, on these things as well. So technology is moving at pace, solutions will move at pace um, uh, uh, along with that. So unfortunately it's a political answer for you, but. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. I hope that answers your question, Paula. Kevin, I don't know if you're able to put your camera on um, just for the uh, final um, piece. Maybe you're not. It doesn't matter if not, but um, oh, there you are. Um, maybe I just couldn't see you. Um, the other questions were about the course and whether it's springboard funded. And the uh, short answer is we don't know yet because the springboard funding for next year hasn't been announced. But um, uh, we will keep everybody posted on that. Um, do you mind if I ask a question uh, again for Kevin in relation to your law background? Um, because um, you didn't take the traditional route of the law graduate who goes on to the professional qualifications and um, uh, becomes a solicitor, um, but did something entirely different. How, how did you feel that you're, uh, and I have to say we're very proud uh, of the fact that you're a law graduate of LYIT. How did that um, set you up for life in the privacy world? Um, I suppose, first of all, before I, I directly answer that, I, I will just go back to something that Naomi kind of uh, pointed out, how practical this course is, the MA, how practical it is for, for business. That is something that I need to echo, and I'm just mm -hmm. delighted that that culture still remains at LYIT or ATU. It'll be LYIT forever for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but like, I, I'm just delighted that that culture is still there because, like, when we did the the um, the law course um, at, at LYIT, it was very much industry focused. It had modules that that basically set us up and and set us aside from other um, applic applicants going into uh, to work in the law firm. Um, at the outset, it was simple things like, you know, having that access to the technology platform, Opsys, SAM accounts that was widely used by all the, the law firms at the time. So that meant that as we went into our interviews, we were able to say, yes, we were exposed to this stuff already. So ultimately, I, I just like that practicality. Um, I suppose, yeah, absolutely a windy road for me to, to, to get to privacy, but ultimately if I hadn't had the law degree, I don't think I would have ha had the exposure to regulation. Like ultimately working in a, a law firm, for example, you're, you're in a heavily regulated environment with our clients, heavily regulated. So you're following regulation all the time, you're horizon scanning. As Naomi said, I, I am well aware of receiving uh, dear CEO letters and that dread that comes over and you're like, how do I operationalize this? Like, what, what am I going to need to, to, to deal with this now? And that's where like, I, I basically eventually got exposed to um, data privacy. And in particular, I started uh, following it uh, in the early days of 2015, 2016, when it was, um, we knew it was going to be the, what we call now the, the, the GDPR. So ultimately, I think the exposure from uh, the LYIT course actually led me to this path. One of the things that I also want to call out is, um, I think people's understanding of a compliance program sometimes um, might be a little bit limited. A compliance program, as, as Naomi has said uh, uh, as well, and um, sorry, as uh, Fiona has said, like it, it's not the traditional tick box exercise. We're not sat there doing the same things day in and, uh, and day out. Like these are really, really um, interesting, intricate 
ever changing environments like we're we're looking at all this uh, regulation coming down the line we're actually sat there we're we're having to like decipher very complex pieces of legislation whether that's legislation in relation to financial services in relation to data protection and that means as a law graduate i i was best placed to actually decipher the gdpr bring that uh, to 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 the law firm for example Ample, bring that to the financial services firm I worked in, and now in my, in my daily role here in, in uh, Meta, for example, you're able to actually convert those requirements, apply it to the actual business that you're in, because, you know, it is so fluid. Like uh, the answer that I would have when I look at the regulation I'm working at the law firm and the practical application of it in that sense is very different to what it would be like here in Meta. Like in uh, the financial services firm, for example, you have a lot of guidance because you have regulation that's there that's going to tell you how long can I keep the information for? How long should I keep the information for? You're looking at all these intricate pieces of legislation, the different requirements from the financial services and pensions ombudsman, for example, who expect us to hold data forever and a day. And that comes out of things like, you know, the tracker mortgage scandal, because, you know, there, there, there was issues there. But then you have the Data Protection Commission saying you can only hold this information so long as it's necessary. How do you marry those two things? It's very difficult. You look at things like, you know, the changing face of finance now in, in this country. We look at uh, two banks leaving because, like, would you argue that we're overregulated in financial services because the cost of compliance might be getting too high for, for certain um, for, um institutions like is that is 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 that a disincentive to work in in this uh, environment but then you look at different companies like pepper who i had uh, worked in previous to to meta where you have large institutional investors buying swathes of uh of, of mortgages in in large portfolios but you're looking then from a legal perspective that you're splitting legal title there so like you have a beneficial title holder now and a legal title holder how does data protection actually come in there? Because the beneficial title holder are entitled to the funds, but as a legal title holder, I'm going to be the one that's going to be making all those decisions. I'm the data controller, so I make all those decisions. So what information can I give to the person that actually owns this loan? The answer is none. And that can be very frustrating for an investor, but you need to have that legal background. Then if you're like in a technology firm, for example, it's completely different again, because how does data transfer and transgress and move through your system? Like it's, it's not so easy, it's not so straightforward. So it goes right back to what we said at the beginning. It's like, it's a technology neutral regulation, but it is very, very fluid. So I think in the short answer, um, the, the law degree really does, it, it just sets you up for basically well to, to understand regulation, to understand how to decipher that regulation. And then like uh, the practical elements of the course basically empowers you. How, to, how do you navigate your way through? How, how do you actually put yourself forward? How do you deal with this in a practical sense? So um, again, just delighted that uh, that, that um, ethos remains at, at, at ATU, that it is industry focused and please keep it going. It still very much is, Kevin, and thank you so much for that. Your long answer was much better than your short answer. And uh, I have to say there's so much learning in this for me, which is kind of ironic because I was a law lecturer when you were here many years ago as an undergrad, uh, and I'm learning so much from, from you right now and from all the speakers this evening. Um, so the MA in um, Governance and IT is a very applied uh, industry-based uh, programme. We've changed the title. We haven't changed very much else. There's a new module in blockchain been introduced, which as you gather from this evening is hugely topical, but the, the essence of the programme remains the same. So if any of the uh, participants this evening are interested in knowing more about the programme, you can email me at siobhan.cullen at lyit or Donald Hannigan, the professional and executive education coordinator at donald.hannigan at lyit. Going back to Kevin's point that it will always be lyit. So we are very much ATU Donegal, uh, but we still have our lyit email addresses for now. Um, I have to say, I feel very privileged this evening to be in the company of our guest speakers. So I think we're going to have to finish up. And it's such a shame that we have run out of time because it's so interesting hearing from uh, all our speakers. So many thanks to Joanne Enright, to Kevin McLaughlin, to Fiona Gilday and to Naomi Hegarty, all of whom are very busy people for giving up their time uh, to speak to us this evening. And thanks again to Donald Hannigan, 
for organising uh, the event so well. Thanks to everyone for just one, one more question has come in there, Siobhan. Oh, if you just sorry, want to, to the chat your grant, yes, yeah, just in relation to a start date. Oh yes, the uh, the start date will be September. Uh, there may be an induction um, uh, this side of the summer holidays um, to get everybody together, to get to know each other. Um, uh, so we're looking really for a sort of application end date of the end of May, ideally. And then we may have a, an induction welcoming event in June and the start date will be uh, in September. So feel free to email us for more information. Thanks, Donald. Thanks again, everybody, um, for your, your great participation. And thanks, everybody, for listening. So good evening from Donny Donegal. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone.